A Russian MiG-31 fighter jet Tuesday escorted two B-1 bombers from the U.S. Air Force over the Barents Sea near the Arctic Ocean, which separates Russia from Alaska. That according to a statement from the Russian Defense Ministry. The statement read that as the Russian jet approached, the U.S. bombers adjusted the course of their flight, moved away, and then turned from the border. The incident comes in the context of report Tuesday from the director of Russia's Federal Security Service, Alexander Bortnikov, that data obtained from those detained in Friday's terrorist attacks in the Moscow Concert Hall confirmed links to Ukraine. He added that Ukrainian special forces were involved in the terrorist act, while some members of ISIS had helped to prepare it. For an update on the investigation and a look at some of the big picture questions raised, we go to Moscow to speak with analyst and political commentator Mark Sloboda. Mark? So the death toll from the terror attack uh, in Moscow uh, continues to rise. Uh, the last time I checked, it's over 137, uh, you know, with uh, more than uh, 150 injured. Um, and the at least the four principal gunmen who were able to flee the scene uh, have been taken into custody and another 11 people who are believed to be have provided some degree of support logistical support organization uh, uh for this uh terror cell uh have also been detained uh the work of of the investigative committee assigned uh continues um and they have evidently already contacted turkey uh, evidently, there are some links to a terror network in Turkey, and Turkey has already supposedly rounded up over a hundred people uh, who may have had uh, some level of involvement with the group ostensibly uh, who committed the terror attack or that the four gunmen were uh, possibly – had some small degree of association, which which is ISIS K, ISIS Horasan, which is the ISIS spinoff or subsidiary um, that conducts operations in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, in some parts of Central Asia, including Tajikistan, which is where the four gunmen who were detained uh, are from, and a num evidently a number of the other uh, support network are, are also uh, from Tajikistan. Now, the Russian government has made clear that they don't believe that ISIS-K was solely responsible for this. In fact, they feel that ISIS-K is a sock puppet that it is a fig leaf of plausible deniability. And in fact, that four Tajiks were recruited specifically for this operation because it is plausible that they could be members of ISIS-K. However, there is no history of radicalization of these four individuals that we have had publicly revealed yet. During the attacks, they made no political or religious declarations, and they have not done so uh, that we have seen uh, so far uh, afterwards during the detention or during their appearances uh, thus far in court. Um, the uh, hallmark for uh, an ISIS-style terror attack like this is a suicide operation where they fight to the death, um, and uh, their primary motivation is martyrdom. Uh, that, is, that is the ISIS hallmark. And, and this very bizarrely uh, deviates from this. Uh, they are quite clear that they were, uh, they were contacted via uh, social media network Telegram, um, and they were paid money to do this, with some of it delivered up front and some of it to be delivered upon the completion. And they did not fight to the death. They fled the scene, at least four of them did, um, and uh, they threw away their weapons, uh, um, and they were eventually um, stopped. Now, it's very interesting where they were stopped. They were making a beeline to the Russian-Ukrainian border which is absolutely bizarre. That is an active war zone with 
wouldn't would expect heavily heavy you know border security military forces on both sides of the border right artillery shells mines everything um so why would they believe that they could have sanctuary in ukraine russia is so big there are so many avenues they could have fled to central asian states that that uh, uh share a border with russia they could have fled to the caucasus uh they could have fled to uh, you know uh, any any number of the countries that russia borders but they chose to flee to ukraine all right and that i think is the most damning obvious piece of evidence so far um that um that uh, that this whole isis k uh is um really a sock puppet and the uh russian uh fsb chief the head of the um uh fsb is the russian domestic intelligence equivalent of the fbi who's uh, uh in charge of the investigation uh, has been perfectly clear that the Russian government is compiling, still compiling evidence, but they believe that behind the the fig leaf of ISIS K, that the Kiev regime uh, in Ukraine and as well the U.S. and the United Kingdom are behind organizing this terror attack as an attempt to destabilize the country and erode political support for the government because they uh, and you know, presumably the special military operation in Ukraine because they're losing so badly on the battlefield that that's really all they have left at this point. And this is not something new. The Kiev regime has dozens, if not hundreds of former ISIS fighters in its ranks. And this has been talked about in the Western mainstream media, not so much now, but before the current outbreak of hostilities, it was widely admitted. The Daily Beast had a piece on it back in 2015, a former ISIS fighters in the Sheikh Mansour battalion that fight for the Kiev regime. There are also a number of other former ISIS jihadis who fight in the International Legion. Um, And the Western media has also talked about how ISIS leaders have basically used Ukraine um, as a sanctuary point for then disseminating elsewhere in the world, including Europe, that they were essentially given sanctuary in Ukraine. Uh, and, and this has been admitted previously by the Western mainstream media. So there's a long association of the Kiev regime with ISIS, particularly ISIS fighters of former Soviet uh, 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 countries, uh, or from Chechnya, from um, uh, the Central Asian uh, countries, who are of a Wahhabist bent, but who have particular grievances against Russia for fighting against them in Chechnya, in Syria, and the, and the likewise. And as far as they're concerned, a jihadi is a useful tool as long as it can be turned against Russia. But that's a hallmark of the United States as well, because in Syria, they uh, completely backed head chopping suicide jihadis for use in overthrowing the Syrian government and fighting Russian forces that came to prevent that. And I think um, it has to be noted something about ISIS-K. And don't take my word for it. Take Seth Harp, who is a credible mainstream American journalist. He writes for Rolling Stone, where he's also an editor, and Harper's. Right. Um, And he has done a lot of work on this. Um, And the leader of ISIS K, who goes by the Nam de Guerre, Shahab al Muhajar, he made a post on Twitter about him. He's also written articles about this. The leader, incredible, the leader of ISIS K was a contractor at Bagram, the U.S. Air Force and military base in Afghanistan during the occupation, then worked security for drug lord Rashid Dastoum a top CIA proxy who was also vice pre- a vice president of the U.S. installed proxy regime in Afghanistan. And he later worked for Amrullah Saleh, chief of the NDS, the Afghan proxy government's intelligence service, literally the CIA's right-hand man in Afghanistan, and he highlights it. It's right there on the Wikipedia page with articles. So what he's saying is that ISIS-K has always been a CIA sock puppet. That, that there's a long history. And if you look at what ISIS-K has done, it's primarily fighting the Taliban. 
uh, as well as Pakistani governments and the governments in Central Asia, rather than, say, the U.S. that occupied their country for 20 years or Israel, you know, that is committing genocide against Pal Palestinians. Um, uh, the Taliban, in fact, condemned the uh, terrorist attack in Moscow, offered their condolences to the Russian people, which yeah. is more than the U.S. government did, and noted that they've been fighting ISIS-K for years. Yep. Uh, so that that <laughs> we'll pick this up next week, but that, I don't know. That's that it sounds pretty conclusive already, even though we're still in the investigation stage. Thanks for your time, and we'll speak with you again next week. Thanks for having me. For KPFK, I'm Don DeBar.